You're listening to Opus Talks, where you'll be in on conversations with insiders in the energy, chemicals, and environmental commodities markets. Guests share insights into the latest trends and innovations, industry challenges, and much more. Let's dive into the conversations that explore where the energy economy is headed, right here on Opus Talks. Hello, I'm Denton Sinkograna, Chief Oil Analyst at Opus, a Dow Jones company. And this week on this podcast, we have a, a real treat here with heating oil season coming up. I want to learn more about how distributors and dealers kind of kind of hedge their purchases of he- heating oil. So joining us today is Elaine Levin from Powerhouse. She's the president over there. I have a long, long history with Elaine. Goes back to my first couple of weeks at Opus. I went to one of Elaine's hedging classes in 2001. Uh, you know, basically very, very green at Opus. And one of the treats was we got to go to the NYMEX trading floor and pretend trading. And uh, you get a lot of respect for these guys who are yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs for the past, for, you know, five hours at a time. So, Elaine, welcome. And tell us a little bit more about Powerhouse and and how you guys help your clients. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, At Powerhouse, we help our clients control their profit margins and build their business through using financial instruments and hedging. You know, as you know, I mean, you make your bread and butter on it, that oil prices are volatile and there's always something happening. They're geopolitical in nature. They span our borders. What can influence our market can be everything from China to Saudi Arabia to South America. So businesses have risk when prices move up and down. They also have opportunity when prices move up and down because ultimately the end user of fuel is very interested in trying to get that volatility out of their bottom line as well and do some budgeting and planning. So we can help clients put together cap prices, fixed prices. We also help companies deal with the loss of value of fuels in transport, like in a pipeline or by barge or by rail car. As we know, days are getting shorter, a little bit colder, and that stuff is really coming quickly. And that means for at least a section of the country, that means heating oil needs to be purchased if it hasn't been already. So we're in October. Have distributors and dealers of heating oil already missed our opportunity to hedge our needs? Or is it or is there still time left? Well, as you know, prices have been falling. We've had a lot of downward pressure in the market. So for anyone who hasn't planned on anything for the upcoming heating season, you know, we're having a sale. <laughs> but um, for many in the heating oil space, they like to offer what's called a cap, which means that if prices go higher, the end user, the homeowner's price is capped. It won't go above a certain level. But if prices fall, they have the opportunity to participate in prices going lower. We see this as a win-win for the companies who offer these because it puts the company on the same side of the table as the end user. I mean, you always have good news. If you're offering a cap program, well, if prices go up, you get to say, hey, I got great news. You're in our cap program. We got your back. We're not going to raise our price. And if prices fall, well, you still have good news because you get to say, because you're our company's customer, we're going to pass along the savings to you. So uh, these cap programs, you have to be able to hedge and there's an option involved in it. You can't do a cap program without an option. And that's where Powerhouse comes in to help put these together and execute the strategy. Let's take a little bit of a step back there. And you mentioned an option. And I do have a little bit of a knowledge of options, but it's, you know, it's certainly not anywhere near what yours is. But you know, a call option is the ability, but not the obligation to buy at a certain price. And a put, the two most common calls and puts, and the put is the uh, option, but not the obligation to sell at a, at a certain price point. So you're mentioning the cap program and you use the option in case prices are going above that cap. How would you know an example of that work? So mechanically, what happens is I like to think about an option as analogous to an insurance policy. Now, if I buy a call option, let's say, and I don't have any other physical commitments, well, if prices go higher on the NYMEX, then that call option 
if it, the NYMEX trades above the strike, there'll be a payoff. Think of that as like having an accident with your auto insurance. And if you have an accident, you're not going to get a new car. You're going to get a money to offset the damage done. Well, it's the same thing with any financial hedging instrument. You know, you're not buying your fuel from the futures market, but if the call option winds up with value at the end of the period or when you liquidate it, well, then the proceeds go to offset the higher price that the company will be paying at the rack. If markets fall, well, you bought some insurance you didn't need, if we're going to use the analogy, and you get to float down with the lower price. So your, your, your car didn't get into an accident. That's correct. That's great. So, you know, we're talking mostly about heating oil because it's getting to be that time of year. Can some of those same principles be applied for, for gasoline? So if you're a retailer, right now things are looking better. We're going through the grade change to a winter grade. We're seeing the market fall. This is normally good for retail margins. Now, when I teach the hedging class, one of the things I talk about, you know, we're here in D.C., uh, Powerhouse is a D.C.-based company, so I always talk about the true meaning of conservative and liberal, which is conservative means keep. So how can retailers keep good margins at a time when they anticipate that squeeze happening in the spring when you start to see the change to summer grade turn around and the ramp up to summer driving? So there is a slightly different hedging strategy but it would take a little more than half an hour to get into right, it. Right. But, it's, but the idea is as prices go higher, that's bad for the retailer because they tend to see their margin squeeze unless they want to give up volume. So there are hedging cures for that. And so going back to, to heating oil and the cap programs, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, you, you, there's not a really a drop dead date to, to start to get involved with, say, buying that, that call option, say, for example. You could probably do it in October. You may even be able to do it in, you know, in, in, in November. But about what, the timing, when do the, you normally start to see heating oil distributors come to you and say, hey, it's time for us to look at some calls? We always say one of the questions you should ask yourself when you start to think about hedging is what is my risk? If I do not have any commitments, then I don't have any risk. So a lot of times you'll see the heating oil distributor, they will offer a program to their customers. So the minute that they want to announce that they're offering a cap, they should have that covered in case something hits the markets from left field. You don't want to have your margins exposed. In the case of the gasoline retailer, they have a little more subjectivity because they're selling gasoline all year long. But when margins are good, what's your risk that they're going to get worse? So when things are good is the time that you should start thinking about starting a hedging program. And a lot of times you'll see that be in the fourth quarter. So the, yeah, there's no like kind of drop dead date where if you don't have it done by a certain time, you're, you're in trouble. But you know, obviously I would sense that it's the earlier, the better that you're on top of it. If you're offering that, that the cap program that you were talking about. That's right. You never want to offer a cap or a fixed price to an end user and not have the hedge in place because that's how companies go out of business. You know, next thing you know, they offer a cap or a fixed price. They don't cover it one way or the other. And Russia invades Ukraine. And, you know, that would not be good. Right, right. Yeah, so let's talk about the, the diesel futures market right now. So for the last couple of years, we've seen some really high priced diesel. And, you know, you and I, we and people that, that are following the futures market, we talk about Contango, we talk about backwardation. Simply put, Contango is the price today is, is cheaper than the price tomorrow. And backwardation is a price today is more expensive than the price tomorrow. We're starting to shift into more of a Contango market. How does that change any of the, of the calculus for you when you're, when you're looking at trying to get someone set up? Well, one of the nice things about a carrying market is it does keep the system going better. For example, when we had that steep backwardation, our customers were less likely to hold inventory and want to hedge it because they would lose value when they had to 
roll their hedge into the next month. You also saw it add risk into say, let's you're shipping barrels up from the Gulf up the Colonial. There too, you would lose value if the month changed on you. Right now, we do not have that as an issue. So I think you're seeing distributors and wholesalers throughout the Northeast and actually throughout the country breathing a bit of a sigh of relief because it adds stability to supply. There's a correlation between backwardation and whether or not you're going to see inventories gain or lose. You know, in carry markets, you tend to see inventories increase. In backwardated markets, you tend to pull inventory. And it's kind of a chicken and an egg. But, you know, in the end, what happened was high prices cured high prices. I mean, look at those diesel cracks that we saw. The refiners were getting values, you know, close to $70 for a diesel crack. I mean, that's more like what a producer was getting for drilling as opposed to refining. Um, And you yourself have presented more than once about all the capacity additions that we've seen around the country. Well, I should really say around the world and also in our own country. So those capacity additions coming online now with, you know, a light turnaround schedule for the for, for this fall turnaround, you know, we built a lot of diesel back. Plus, we're also adding renewable diesel and biodiesel into the mix. I mean, your government and mine just stated the EIA was talking about how they're now looking at the whole distillate demand number to include the renewable diesel because they were missing what's now becoming a material part of the count in places like California. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not uh, an insignificant amount. You know, depending on who you talk to, some might say it's it's 50-50 legacy diesel and, you know, 50% legacy diesel, 50% renewable diesel as, as to what the consumption is out, out in California right now. Uh, and there's predictions that it's going to be maybe not 100% because, you know, it's very difficult considering some logistics in, in California, but probably get pretty close to 100% within the next couple of years with the amount of diesel, renewable diesel that's A, being produced and B, being imported as well. So to that point, is it is it kind of the same sort of hedging there? Is it the you know? And again, I think we're simplifying it with just talking about the call option. But is that kind of the same principle as well? Yes, and actually, if you start to see that carry get material, it will give the signal to any of those who have storage to start filling it. So that's when it gets interesting because if that carry gets wide enough to cover the cost of money and the cost of storage. Well, then, in effect, the market's paying you to deploy those assets. So you start to see more and more go into inventory. So that's one thing. And it's always nice to have inventory going into winter. I mean, that's really been the challenge that we've had the last few years post the invasion of Ukraine by Russia was that the world got caught short diesel inventory after the pandemic and all the loss of refining at that time. Right. So I I find, you know, kind of the the use of of, of options pretty fascinating and and always love to learn what kind of education resources are are available to learn more about quote unquote hedging. Well, call me biased, but you know, as a graduate, and I give you an A plus, by the way, (laughs) on (laughs) on your description, of your calls inputs. We at Powerhouse teach a hedging class twice a year. And as you know, I started doing it for Opus over 20 years ago, and it's since migrated to Powerhouse. But we have our next hedging class coming up in November, November 21st and 22nd in Austin, and it's selling at a pretty good clip. We're going to limit it to about 30 people so that it's not too big and there's interaction. We've had people come to this class and really are able to hit the ground running with a hedging program after taking it. We've also had people come back and 
take it more than once because once you start hedging, it means different. Actually, Denton, you should come back because I'd be very curious to hear how you would hear it, you know, all these years later, as opposed to being very green in the industry. I think you'd have very different takeaways at this time. I think so too. So now when you're, you know, obviously these classes, and again, if I could, I remember I've been hitting the head a lot, but I do remember portions of it. And I remember just to, all the sheer amount of, uh, of data you use in this. So besides just simply looking at, you know, kind of futures prices, what other data sets do you use? Do, is there, you know, is it, is it racks? Is it retail? Tell us a little bit more about how that gets incorporated. Sure. Well, of course, as Opus knows, you know, you're taking a look at that value chain that you have on your spot ticker every day. So you see the futures and how they influence the spots, how they influence the racks, how a new story, whether it's refining or something regionally, can move those. You're also looking at the futures markets. The relationship between the months, as we were talking about, is very important. And then we also get into not only the fundamental data, looking at supply and demand, but we also spend some time in the class talking about technical analysis. Because remember, everybody who buys and sells a future, and even if you're not currently involved in hedging, my guess is your supplier down the chain somewhere is. So as you're buying and selling, well, that they have to adjust their futures position and it all gets the futures market is open and transparent. Every deal is reported. You don't know who it is, but it is reported. And as a result, we have a wonderful data set where you can look at the actual buying and selling of real participants. It's called technical analysis. And we talk about trends. We talk about support and resistance and you know some of those statistics that you'll hear like RSI. There's also the money flows in and out, which would be volume and open interest. So there's a lot of information you can get from futures trading about the, you know, this would fall under behavioral finance, but you know, what, how are the market participants feeling by how they're deploying their assets into the market? The whole voting with your pocketbook type of thing. Exactly. Exactly. And we know these are all Real deals by real people with real money behind them. That's right. So, uh, okay. So let's uh, kind of continue on here. But, you know, okay. So I was once a young professional, uh, you know, starting with Opus and had the pleasure of being at that class like two weeks in. But what kind of advice do you have for, for young professionals that are kind of looking to getting into commodity trading, hedging, or or even current professionals looking to advance their skills. They can obviously go to the powerhouse class. That's that's a number one. But what else is out there? I would also say, I mean, of course, there's a lot of information from the exchanges themselves, from the NYMEX, um, reading a lot of the, the petroleum press is always good. Um, but remember, there is nothing like the school of hard knocks. And if you really want to do this, you need to find... Uh, a competent broker to work with. I like to say there's only one in America. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> but, you know, you and you want to pick a pilot program to start. I mean, you're not going to be Southwest Airlines on your first day hedging 80% of your fuel. Um, but you want to pick something, whether it's maybe you have an end user who's coming to you and asking about a fixed price or you're thinking about offering a cap price, or maybe you're thinking about shipping barrels or holding inventory or self-supplying. You know, these are all things that we see, and we can talk to you about the strategy and the cash flows and what it'll look like, but there's nothing to focus the mind like actually doing it. Because one thing I'll tell you not to do is we'll run into people who will say, you know what, I'm going to paper trade this and I'm going to come back and do a fictitious account. And of course, if you're trading fictitiously, well, then you're always buying the low and selling the high. You don't know what it's like to actually have a margin call. And then that piece of paper with your buys and sells when you get busy goes to the side of the desk. Whereas if you actually do this, 
you can, you will actually know what all these decisions feel like. And it really, like I said, focuses the mind. But I will also say this, and I've seen it a million times. Futures, options, swaps, they are now just part of the toolkit for petroleum distributors, for retail marketers. And if you don't have them, well, you don't have a full set of tools. But once you know how these tools operate, you will look at your business differently because all of a sudden somebody may come along, whether it's an end user asking for help or a supplier with a certain type of supply deal. And in the past, if you didn't have a way to push that risk into the market, you had to say pass. Now you can actually make a a business decision whether or not this is something you want to do, but you'll have the toolkit at your disposal to get rid of that risk on the bottom line, or at least attempt to. Back to uh, heating oil, and I have kind of really one final question about you know heating oil in general in the Northeast, and it, you know it's it's a sunsetting industry. Less and less homes are are using are, are using heating oil than say maybe twenty years ago, thirty years ago, forty years ago. But in the past few winters, they've been a little bit warmer than normal uh, in those primary parts of the country where where heating oil is used. Does that make it the need to hedge even more important? Well, you know, you're you're trying to do more on less gallons, of course. Now, everybody and their brother's calling for a warm winter again, which the contrarian in me say that maybe we're finally <laughs> due for a, a colder winter. We do have La Nina coming back. But yes, of course, you want to be as efficient as possible. You want to try to attract customers. See, for me, I think offering a cap or a fixed price, but in the heating oil space, particularly a cap, it differentiates you from the competition. I mean, if you're only going to be selling today's price, then you always have to be the prettiest girl at the dance. Whereas if you're offering a program or you're offering A and B, you're giving your customer different solutions. And if they're worried about budgets being tight for this winter, well, then they have an opportunity to do something and you're solving as their supplier a problem. I mean, when you pay the premium for an option, a lot of times these heating oil distributors will market it as a program fee or a sign-in fee, or they'll get you on budget. I mean, we have a lot of different ideas of how and seen a lot of different ways that these companies have been successful marketing this. But it also makes the customer more sticky to you, because if you have somebody in a pricing program over time, well, what are they not doing during that time they're committed? Hopefully they're not talking to your competition. That's why companies go through the headaches of putting this together. It's a marketing opportunity, but it also makes the customer more sticky to you, if you will. Gotcha. Okay. This is kind of, well, not necessarily my favorite part, but one of my favorite parts of of doing this, it's the random question. So Elaine, you've been in Washington, D.C. for for a long time. Um, That city does not have the best reputation being that, you know, the federal government's there. I I hear often the whole drain the swamp type of thing, but there's got to be some good parts about it, right? So tell us some of the good things in D.C. Well, D.C. is actually a very vibrant city. We've got wonderful food scene. We've got um, lots to do. And by the way, I encourage everyone to come to Washington, D.C. because to visit the museums, to visit the monuments, everyone is always very impressed and you're paying for it already through your taxes. So you might as well come and enjoy the nation's capital. And by the way, I always say as a D.C. native, the people who live here aren't so bad. It's the crazies that get sent here from around the country (laughs) that we have to deal with. So so come in and share the love. But no, it's, it's a great city. It's a lot of fun. And we do our hedging class here every spring because we are D.C. based. And so it's fun to do in our backyard. A lot of times people stay the weekend and there's. The, the feedback's always the same. I had a great time. I you know, visited Mount Vernon. I visited uh, the Smithsonian. I got to touch the moon rock. You know, and it's, so there's a lot of great things here. 
you know, you, you did highlight one of the basic points is, hey, you've already paid for it. So why not come and see it? So, OK, one follow up to that. What's your favorite restaurant right now in D.C.? Uh, well, I would say it's the Diplomats where I like to go. But if you do want to come and see and be seen and see where all the politicians go, right around the corner, our office is based in Georgetown. So Cafe Milano, if you do want a politician sighting, that's probably or a celebrity sighting, that's probably the place to go. And it's just around the corner from where we are. Awesome. Well, Elaine, thank you again. And, you know, anyone who's listening, if you want to see Elaine in person and then pull her aside and ask her some more questions, I know Elaine's going to be not not just there, but also presenting this year at the Sigma conference in Boston, November 12th through 14th. Uh, I'll be there too. If you want to say hi to me, uh, that'd be nice too. So Elaine, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for really being a friend for the last, you know, 20 some years to me and, and really helping educate me through, through, over the years. I mean, it's just been an absolute pleasure. Well, right back at you. I always <laughs> love getting together with you and having a cocktail, sitting back and discussing the markets. I always learn something too. And that's the great thing about our industry. You know, there's always so much going on, so much to learn. And thank you for doing this podcast. It's a great service so that people can come and hear what you have to say. Elaine, thanks again. And we'll see you in November. And everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, That's all the time we have for now. And we'll catch you next time on Opus Talks. We hope you've enjoyed today's insider conversation on Opus Talks. Join us next time for a deep dive into another industry insider's world. You can find more Opus Talks episodes at opusnet.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.